name is Mary Ellen, and I'm going to be your guide for our senior session today as we walk around our Australasia Pavilion. I'm so excited to have everybody joining me. If you like this program, head over to the torontozoo.ca website or .com website and take a look at some of our other programs that we offer under Zoo to You. So we're gonna get started today in a moment, but first I just wanna mention that we are currently closed to the public, but we are still caring for the 5,000 animals that call the Toronto Zoo their home. And I'm really excited to be able to introduce you to some of those animals here today. So in a second, I'm gonna turn the camera around and I'm gonna take you guys on a tour with me of our Australasia Pavilion as we focus on some conservation programs and also different zoo careers and jobs that we offer here for you to learn a little bit more about. So I'm gonna flip the camera now and turn us around and meet our first animal guest. So you guys are gonna be walking around with me seeing what I see today. So first up, this is Puzzle. She is a tree kangaroo. Now Puzzle is a really interesting first animal for us to see as she focuses and directs our attention to animals who are endangered. So an endangered species is an animal or plant species whose numbers are declining quite heavily in the wild uh, for reasons we may or may not know. Uh, in terms of Puzzle here, she faces habitat loss from logging, mining, and other farming productions. Now, as you see, if I take a step back for her exhibit here, you'll notice that she's up in the trees. So Puzzle relies on this forest habitat for her survival. She is a tree kangaroo. So she spends the majority of her day in the trees, hanging out, eating her food up there as she's mostly eating saps, leaves, and bark with a few other small mammals thrown in. Um, and she also uses it for protection. So I'll give you guys a quick little zoom in on her here so you can see her up close. She's having a little snack on some brows. And brows are actually another great conservation program that we do here at the zoo. Um, and we'll get into that in a couple seconds. All right, we're gonna keep going. I wanna introduce you guys to a uh, list that we have here and we use here at the zoo. And if you've ever visited the Toronto Zoo before, if you're able to come back in the future when we reopen, you may have seen this list before. So this is called the red list and it's a global scale that's used to measure uh, the numbers of wild populations of different species. So we see this for animals and plants. And this is right now where the tree kangaroo falls. So they are listed as endangered. And if I get a little bit closer onto the list, you can see down here at the back side of it, we have not evaluated and data deficient. So essentially those areas of an animal or plant species threatened. That's a pretty good place for animals and plants to be. It means their numbers are doing okay, or they're at least stable right now in the wild. But it means we should keep an eye on them just in case anything else happens. As they start moving their way down to the end and the right hand side of our list, it gets a little bit worse for them. We don't like seeing species down there as that means they're going to be extinct soon. As we all know, extinct means that they are gone off of the planet forever and we are not able to recover them. So right now tree kangaroos are in the middle here with endangered, and there's lots of ways that the Toronto Zoo and other accredited organizations are helping these animals out and helping them to survive. And we're gonna get into some of those uh, different ways that they help in a few minutes when we visit a couple more of our animal friends. All right, so we're gonna head into our aviary next. So this is actually a free flight area of the zoo which means the birds are all around us. So we're gonna keep our eyes peeled as we walk through and we're gonna try and find a few of our animal friends. I see one right up above us here. In this section, you will notice there's several different bird species who live here, but not only is it important for us to recognize the animal species who live at the zoo, it's really important for us to recognize the plant species that live here as well. And aviaries like this and inside of our pavilions are great ways for us to appreciate them. So inside this building right now, it is actually quite warm and humid, unlike the weather outside today that we're having in Toronto, which is quite cold with snow on the ground. Now the plants that you see in here would not be able to survive outside in our colder Toronto weather. And this is actually a really cool segue into talking about some of the careers that we have here at the zoo. 
we have a whole team of individuals who are dedicated to the management and care of our plant species here at the zoo as well. So we have a greenhouse here at the zoo and we grow these plants from little seedlings. Now when they get a little bit bigger, they're able to come and be planted in the pavilions. Now this is really great for us for a couple reasons. As one, it gives an authentic feel to our habitats. So we lay out our zoo based on regions of the world. So these plants and animals that you find in this billion, we're in Australasia right now, are actually found in places in the world that are around Australia. So you'd actually see these plants there firsthand. The second thing that it does for us is it allows us to care for our animals better. So like I said, in here right now, we are in a free flight aviary. So here's one of uh, my favorite birds that we have here at the zoo. This is called a Victoria crowned pigeon. There's actually four of them in here in total. But these animals like to be in and among and around the trees. So having a really natural habitat for them, something that they would normally find in the wild is great for them to be able to mimic their natural habitat. As well, the other animals who aren't necessarily in this section of the zoo, we can provide them with natural foods for them. So we may not otherwise be able to grow these tropical plants who like a hot, humid environment and feed them to our animals if we didn't have our greenhouse and horticulture departments. Now that's a great segue for me. I was talking about how it's good to have these natural plants for animals uh, that allow them to mimic their natural behavior. And that's one other thing I wanna talk about here. So we have a beautiful sign here all about our enrichments that we give to animals. Now enrichments can come in many different forms. We see them as toys or objects. They can be um, uh, parts of the exhibit or they can even be walks. So some of our other animals like our goats and alpacas, they will actually go on walks through the zoo as their enrichment. This is a good example here. We just saw Puzzle, our tree kangaroo. And this is an example of an enrichment for a tree kangaroo. So we see they have their food stacked up beside them here and she has to reach across to grab it. So because we study animals, we know how much food they need to eat at different stages of their life to ensure that they are going to grow up happy and healthy. But we don't wanna just give them their food all at once. We want them to still use those natural behaviors and skills that they have from being a wild animal. So we give them their food or other items in different toys or objects. And you'll see it changes based on the animal. This is a Komodo dragon. They get like a big leaf bag. The bird up here, they have a pine cone in a plastic tub. And these items that we can give them help to mimic their natural behavior. So we see in the wild that animals spend a lot of their day looking for food. And then a lot of time getting the food out of their objects or their uh, areas or trees where they're pulling it from and then eating it. And we wanna make sure they're spending that time here at the zoo also doing those things. So our wildlife care staff works very hard and dedicates their time to making these enrichments up for our animals to make sure that they have the most natural life here possible. All right, we're gonna come back over and try and spot uh, our Victoria Crown pigeons here again. We got one on the ground in front of us and went off just in the back. Oh, there we go. They're coming out to say hi to us today. So Victoria crown pigeons are actually the largest species of pigeon in the world. They're quite big. I'd say if you have a house cat at home, they're a little bit bigger than they are, um, but they're actually considered a near threatened species. And so on that red list, if you remember, we showed it a moment ago when we were looking at Puzzle, our tree kangaroo, they are listened, list, listed as near threatened, which means there's still time to go out there, help them and ensure that their habitat is safe and happy and healthy for them so that they are able to continue to have increase in their population rather than a decrease in their population numbers. Now, even though they're more of a ground dwelling bird, which means they like to live on the ground, they can fly, not very well though, um, they mostly walk on the ground. They do still nest in trees and rely on those trees for safety for themselves and their babies as well. All righty. So we're going to come through our doors here and we're going to head over and look at some of our reptiles that we have here at the zoo. 
So this is what I like to call our kind of reptile wing or wall here. So we have a few different ones and you'll be able to see me as well in the reflection there. So we have a couple different turtle species living here in this pavilion, as well as a black tree monitor. Now he's feeling a little shy today. So he's just up there at the top of our screen, but he is moving around a little bit for us. It's just up there at the top. So they're a pretty cool species to have around. Now who I really wanna talk about here is our lovely snake wall. So we're gonna come over and take a look at our emerald tree boas and our green tree pythons. So there's actually a glass divider here in the middle, if you guys can't see it. So these are two different snakes on the left and the right. The emerald tree boa is on the left-hand side of the screen and the green tree python is on the right. Now, the reason I want to talk about them is a moment ago, I mentioned that the zoo is laid out geographically. So where those areas are in the world, that's where you find the animals living in them. We have pavilions like Australasia, African Rainforest, Indo-Malaya Pavilion, and the Americas Pavilion here. And all the animals who live in those buildings are from that area of the world, except for our emerald tree boas. And that's because these two snakes are showing us a really cool uh, con or evolutionary design that they have. And that is called convergent evolution. So you can see me there in the reflection, but essentially we can see that these snakes are from South America, while the green tree pythons are from Australasia. And yet people come here to the zoo and they see these two snakes and they think they're the exact same because they do look very similar. I'll kind of get close in on them here for you, uh, but you can see they're both very green in color. And we see this because they are uh, a snake who lives in the trees. So we call those animals who live up in trees arboreal species. And they're green to help them camouflage. Now these two snakes specifically, uh, they live up in the trees and they also live in same climates. So because they have the same humidity and temperature coming at them all year round, that's why they have grown to look very similar to each other. Now, don't get me wrong, I think these snakes are really awesome. They are very cool. In fact, most of our reptiles here are. But unfortunately, these guys are facing some pretty major threats from humans right now in the wild. And I wanted to speak to you guys a little bit about the pet trade that we see in the world. So reptiles are often a animal of interest for a lot of people of having them as pets in their house um, or in their business or anything like that. And we wanna make sure that when we're getting species, we're not getting them from the wild. If you wanna have a pet or anything like that, you need to be putting in the research to check that animal out to make sure they're not endangered in the wild. You're getting them from is a safe and responsible breeder. So a good example of animals who have been in the pet trade and we've done some work to help keep their numbers healthy in the wild is the bearded dragon. So this is probably an animal you might be more familiar with Many people have these as pets, um, but for a while it was a huge issue with them being taken from the wild as well. And actually the Australian government has banned their export from Australia to help with that. So these guys are safe in their natural habitat in the wild and people who would like to purchase a bearded dragon as a pet in their house in other parts of the world can do so from reputable breeders who breed them in that part of the world. So again, it goes to show if you put in the research, we're able to make sure that these animals are staying happy and healthy. All right, so our next area we're gonna go see over here. We're gonna try and play a little bit of I Spy and I'm gonna tell you guys a quick little story before we continue on. This exhibit in front of us is home to a very special animal. Her name is Annie and she is what we call an echidna. Now, unfortunately, I don't see Annie out here. And that's because it's really the wrong time of day to be seeing her in this exhibit. Um, but in fact, for the five years that I have been working at the Toronto Zoo, I have never seen Annie with my own eyes. And that's because she's also an animal who likes to live underground um, and also doesn't like to be up at the same time of day that humans do. So you'll notice all these holes in the exhibit. Some of them are dug from our uh, wombats who are also in here, but a lot of them are from Annie herself. Now people always ask me, what does she look like? If you never see her, how do you know what she looks like? Well, I like to say, imagine a porcupine and a platypus had a baby and we have a nice little photo of her as well. 
So this is her right there. That's what she looks like. Hopefully when the zoo reopens, you will be able to come back and play some I Spy and try and find Annie the Echidna. Now, even though she's not in here for us to look at, there's still some really cool objects in her exhibit. So for example, I'm gonna to point to them now. You guys can see that there are some tunnels. There's these large rock formations. And there's also a swimming pool down here for them. Now people see these objects in the exhibits and they just think we've placed them there. Maybe they're real rocks, anything like that. But in fact, I have a secret to show you guys. So I have with me my coworker, Sean. If you watched some of our earlier broadcasts today, you might notice him or recognize him. He did the primary group this morning. He has with us though, one of the rocks that we use to put in the animal exhibits. So it looks like a regular rock. You know, it's got the texture of one, the color, but if he flips it around here for us, you can see all the breakdown of all the parts individually inside the rock. So as you see, we start underneath with styrofoam. Then we layer mesh netting over top that's metal. They put on textured concrete, and then they put on the final layer of concrete. And that's where they can add color and texture of the rocks. Now you might say that rock looks really realistic. How do we get those exact textures? And that's another thing that we do here. So I'm gonna show our rocks up close here. Our exhibit design team, they actually go out and find real rocks and they will texture them with these mats. So you can see if I hold it to the side, there's bumps and things on it. So they pour some latex on a real rock or maybe a tree branch or any surface they want the texture from and they're able to make a mold from it. And then they use this mold to put real texture on the rocks that we have here in the exhibits. And these add some important features for our animals like dividers and habitats. It makes it look more natural for them as well as it can hide other objects. So sometimes when you see an animal's exhibit, their food or water dish might be hidden inside of one of these fake rocks. Now we're gonna come over here because I believe one of our wombats has come out to say hi, or we actually have both of them here. So this is Arthur and Matilda. There are two wombats that we have here at the Toronto Zoo. And you can see they're sitting next to a beautiful painted background. This is another thing that our exhibit team is so expertly crafting all the time are these beautiful uh, backdrops and murals that you see. So again, it adds a nice scenic, scenic aspect um, for our animals and for our guests coming through to enjoy the zoo. Alrighty, so our next animal we're going to go find is actually the largest lizard out there in the world. And his name is Keelat. So this is Keelat here. I'm gonna focus in on him and try and zoom in better. There he is. So he's actually sitting uh, really close to his basking or heat lamp. So if you didn't know, reptiles, pretty much all of them are cold-blooded or ectothermic animals. And what this means is they are not able to control their own body temperature. So for humans, when we're cold or hot, we can sweat or shiver. And that helps us to change our body temperature uh, to be the right temperature for us. Reptiles, fish, and amphibians have a harder time with that. And so they have to, if they get really cold, they'll go sit under a heat lamp. And if they get really hot, they can go into their water. So he's got a nice little pool there as well uh, that our exhibit design team built for him. Now, Keelat's a really interesting animal for us to look at right now. And he's actually kind of in the same boat as our tree kangaroo who we saw earlier today. And I know it doesn't seem like they're very much related, but what they have in common is what's called an SSP. And this is a species survival plan. And this is again, like the Red List, a globally recognized scale or program that's out there in the world that uses accredited facilities. So places that have accreditation, zoos and aquariums all over the world are part of these SSP plans. And we use them to help conserve specific animal and plant species. So for Keelat and our puzzle, our tree kangaroo, they're part of the SSP for breeding. So we try and match them with an eligible bachelor or bachelorette um, with an animal who's living in another organization and introduce them to each other and see if they like each other enough uh, and to produce the next generation of offspring for their species. So I like to kind of consider an SSP like a dating service for animals 
It's an easy way to look at it for them. Um, and this helps to, again, it can keep those genetics of those animals in captivity uh, strong and healthy so that one day we are able to return them back into the wild with healthy genetics to a population. Now, something else Keelat is really impressive for is he's what's called a keystone animal. Now, the best way to describe a keystone species is to think of a bridge. And at the very top of the bridge, there'll be one stone. And that is called the keystone, because if you take it away, the whole bridge falls down. Well, Keelat is the keystone of his habitat. So if we took him away, his habitat would not be uh, able to survive without him. So what he does is he's kind of like the garbage disposal of his habitat, which doesn't sound too great, but trust me, it's a very important role for him. And essentially what he does is he doesn't care what meat is around him. He will eat it. If he's hungry, he's going to go for snacks. He will hunt his own food himself, but he'll also eat the leftovers of other animals nearby. And by doing this, he's helping to clean up his habitat and make sure that no food is con contracting any diseases or anything like that. He eats it before it can go rotten. He also helps control the herbivore population. So he is a carnivore. He is eating meat. And he will hunt larger livestock like deer, boar, animals like that. Uh, who will, uh, if they're left uh, by themselves and to breed out of control, can destroy a habitat pretty easily uh, by eating all the grass and leaves. So he's there to make sure that that doesn't happen. All right, we're going to keep moving on and head into our underwater section here. There we go. So the first thing we're going to come over and talk about is actually our egg display over here. Now I mentioned earlier we are in the Australasia pavilion and the animal I'm about to talk about right now it doesn't actually live in this building but it's still a really cool program that the zoo is a part of and I wanted to share that with you guys today and that's why we're looking at these eggs although they are sea turtle eggs we're going to be talking about turtle eggs. So there's a species I encourage you to look it up afterwards called the Blanding's turtle and they're actually native to here in Ontario. Now the Blanding's turtles are not doing so well in the wild and their numbers are declining every day. So near the Toronto Zoo, we've noticed there's a couple breeding sites. So what we do is we actually go out and collect the eggs when they're unhatched and we incubate them. So we gave them a uh, controlled setting to hatch in, which increases their numbers of who actually hatches versus who doesn't. Then when these turtles are born, they're about this big. It's about the size of a toonie. It's quite small. And if you imagine if you're a tiny baby turtle and you're the size of a toonie out there in the world, there is a chance that everything will eat you. And it can be a little bit hard for them. So again, this forces their numbers to decline. So what we do here at the Toronto Zoo is we let them grow for two years of age. So they get about this big. So they're about the size of a baked potato when we release them. And that's what we do. We gather them up once they're two years of age and we take them back out to the same habitat we collected the eggs from and we put them back into their environment. And when we do this, we've given them a higher chance of probability of survival because they're larger now. They're more developed and they're able to survive on their own. And when we do this, we do like to collect data from it as well. And so we actually are able to put a little tracker on their back uh, that tells us where they go, where they swim for the first little bit after we release them, so we can see how well they survive and keep going. All right, we're going to keep coming through here, but just because there are so many cool animals in here, I will make sure to try and see as many of them as we can, um, as they are one of the cooler parts of these tours, I know for sure. Everybody's here for the animals. So our first tank up here is actually a coral reef tank. Now this one's really cool because everything you see on screen right now is actually alive. Everything in this tank is living. So not just the two fish that are swimming around in here, but all of the corals that you see as well are living, breathing uh, creatures. And there's even two down here at the bottom that look like little spaceships as well. Now, one of the favorite animals I know when people come to the zoo, they love to see is our lionfish. So I'll show you guys a quick photo 
of our lionfish there, that's what they look like. They're very spiky and they're red and white striped. But I want to tell you guys a little bit about where he is right now and why he's not in the tank. So usually when people think of a, tr a zoo, they usually only think of the people taking care of the animals in the pavilions or buildings as the keepers. And while they are a very important role in our zoo's functioning, there's so many other people behind the scenes who help take care of our animals. So as you'll notice right now, there is no animal in this tank. In fact, there's actually barely any water in this tank. There's just a little bit at the bottom, about an inch or two. So our keepers noticed that our lionfish wasn't feeling too well. So they brought him out of his tank and they brought him to our vets. We have an amazing vet staff team here who take care of all the animals here at the zoo and they work hard all the time to make sure that they have the best care. So we have a full uh, operational zoo hospital here at the Toronto Zoo. Um, and this lionfish was taken there, they looked at him, and while he was getting checked up there, the keepers went into the tank and they've emptied it now. So they can give it a full cleaning before he comes back here to make sure if it was anything in his tank that was making him feel unwell or maybe sick, that they have gotten rid of that issue or at least figured out what it was. Alrighty, so we're gonna come over here. These are another couple examples of animals who like to live in the coral reefs. But again, that first tank that I showed you guys, everything in there was living. It was all real and alive. But in this tank, a lot of the backdrop is actually uh, fake. Just like our stuff that we saw in the echidnas exhibit from the exhibit design team. A lot of what we see in the background here is the same. It's kind of artificially made. Um, for these fish in here. So it's just incredible the art skill that goes into and the planning and designing of all of our exhibits that we have here at the zoo. All right, we're gonna come over here and check out our moon jellies. So these are a really cool species. I hope you guys are getting a good view of them on camera right now, but even to me in person, I don't know if you guys recognize, but they kind of look like an object that we see in our everyday lives. And if you can't guess what it is, they actually look like a floating plastic bag. And for a lot of sea turtles out there in the world, that's essentially what they are, is just a plastic bag bag floating in the water. So they can't tell the difference between plastic and their moon jellies that they're trying to eat. So there's lots of little ways that everyone who's watching today can help out. By bringing your own reusable bags to a grocery store or when you go shopping, you can help out the sea turtles um, and re uh, reduce the amount of plastic that we see in our oceans uh, so that they aren't accidentally eating it um, when they are going hunting for their jellyfish food. All righty. So that's to the end of our tour, everybody. I want to thank you so much for joining me here today at the Toronto Zoo. I hope everyone uh, learned a lot about all of our animals here, the different conservation programs that we run, and all the jobs and careers that we have here. There were so many more, I couldn't fit them all into one video. But I want to hear from you guys as well. So if you guys want, as a school or a class, educators out there, get your group together, and I want you guys to vote. Vote on your favorite animal. Maybe it was one we saw today here on the tour. Maybe it's one from another area of the zoo or maybe one that's not in our zoo at all, but I want you to vote on it and then tell me. So you can send me an email at schools at torontozoo.ca and you're able to let me know which animal you thought was your favorite. So send me an email at schools at torontozoo.ca and say, hi, Mary Ellen, we are such and such class from this school and our favorite animal is this. I'd love to hear from you and respond back to you with some cool facts about your animal. Now there's lots of other ways you can get involved. If you enjoyed this tour and you wanna see more areas of the zoo, be sure to check out our website at torontozoo.com and go to the zoo to you page. We offer multiple different custom programs like this for a lot of different times that you can come and actually talk with me, myself, or Jackie or Sean, any of the other coordinators you might have seen today with our programs. We'd love to have a conversation with you and learn a little bit more about some of the animals who call our zoo home. One last thing I'm gonna say before we head out is if you are in grade 11 and you're looking to get your biology credit, you can also do it here at the Toronto Zoo. So check it out, same thing, go to torontozoo.com, zoo to you, 
and you can learn all about all of our virtual offerings that we're doing right now. All right, everyone, I hope you have a great rest of the day. Thank you so much for joining me. I love taking you around the Australasia Pavilion. All right, take care, everybody.